George Perak's Life, a User's Manual. While the introduction of certain obscure literary works and movements to a wider audience is one of the chief goals of this channel, I'll be the first to admit that some present a greater challenge than others. It can be difficult to describe their Athea without coming off as pretentious and, if not careful, insufferable and off-putting. An outsider should not be faulted for levying such criticisms against, say, the French Ulipo movement of the 1960s and 70s. Today we're going to make a case for the movement by focusing on one of its most esteemed writers and the work that is perhaps its crowning achievement. I'm speaking of the novel Life, a User's Manual, published in 1978 by Georges Perec. Sit back and please enjoy today's edition of Lit Tips. A very brief rundown of the Ulipo. Roughly translated to mean Workshop of Potential Literature, the Olibo was founded in November of 1960 by Raymond Quano and Francois Le Lyonnais. The Olipo members challenged themselves to create works while under self-imposed challenges that they refer to as constrained writing. Examples of this include poems that only use one vowel throughout each line, stories in which each sentence is a palindrome, meaning it can be read the same way backwards and forwards, and several more handicaps that, while surely impressive among the inner circle of the group itself, hold little appeal to even many who would consider themselves adventurous readers, let alone the general public. Georges Perec established himself with books like 1969's The Void, a novel that entirely omits the letter E throughout its 300 pages. The 70s were extremely prolific for Perec, as he continued to publish novels, essays, and even direct a film, The Man Who Sleeps, based on one of his books in 1974. All along, he slowly worked on what would come to be hailed as his masterpiece. And when Life a User's Manual was released, it brought mainstream attention to the Olipo that hadn't been seen up to that point. Life a User's Manual follows the Olipian rules of constrained writing, but in a way that allows for a reading experience far more accessible than anything else to come from the movement. It entails hundreds of stories involving residents of a Parisian apartment block, 11 Rue Simon Courrelier, captured seconds before the clock strikes 8 o'clock p.m. on June 23, 1975. As Perrick methodically takes us through the entire building from its entryway, through the stately first floor suites all the way up into the small apartments, originally used as servants' quarters, of the attic, he hones in on details of the people and objects frozen in this moment of time. Rather than handcuffing himself with the difficulties inherent to the approaches taken in his earlier works, Perrick conversely gives himself the freedom to jump between, bend, and merge genres at will. For instance, a description of a framed photograph leads to the elaborate backstory of a group of siblings who grew up in the building. An initially benign explanation of the contents of another room leads to the tale of how a fire that once broke out in it nearly incinerated the entire block. The stories presented here featuring con artists, detectives, race car drivers, merchants, housewives, actors, scientists, craftsmen, martial artists, writers, painters, explorers, and people from every conceivable walk of life capture an incredibly diverse range of narrative tones. Perrick all the while packs in as many high and low literary references as he can, and he doesn't limit himself just to telling stories, additionally including recipe excerpts from cookbooks, instructions from prescription pill bottles, math problems scribbled in a child's notebook, and anything else that comes to mind. The depth of creativity and imagination on display here is profoundly impressive and inspiring. The closest character Perrick offers to a lead protagonist is a wealthy Englishman named Bartlebooth, who, from a relatively young age, has the means to spend the rest of his life at whatever leisurely activity he chooses, devises a lifelong project that brings several of the other residents of the building into his orbit. Elaborated upon throughout many of these characters' stories, many of which at first seem entirely unrelated, Perrick explains how Bartlebooth's project involves the following steps. First, he spends a decade learning the art of watercolor painting from fellow resident and artist Feline whose own lifelong project involves painting the apartment with its facade removed, revealing the hundreds of lives taking place inside simultaneously. In essence, a visual rendering of the literary project Perrick has undertaken. Bartlebooth hones his skills at landscapes in particular. He then sets out on a 20-year world tour with his servant Smout, described by Perrick as, if not Bartlebooth's Sancho Panza, then at the very least his passerpartout, with the goal of painting a watercolor of one port every two weeks until he has completed 500 pieces. The paintings are then sent back to yet another neighbor, Gaspard Finkler, a craftsman who attaches the piece to a wooden board before cutting it into jigsaw puzzle pieces. Upon completing each puzzle, Bartlebooth passes it on to Georges Morellet, who has developed a solution to rebind the canvas paper for the painting so that it can be removed from the wooden board. The paintings are then sent back to the port where they were originally painted, and 20 years to the day of their completion are dissolved in a chemical solution, erasing all evidence of Bartlebooth's efforts. The blank canvases are then mailed back to Bartlebooth. 
The project in total is planned to take up 50 years of his life, with the intention that he will die having left nothing behind. Age takes its toll on Bartleboot's health and eyesight, however, and he dies while working on his 439th puzzle. The frozen moment in which the entire present day portion of the novel is set happens seconds after Bartleboot's death at his desk, puzzle piece in hand. Despite its title, Life A User's Manual does not ever actually proclaim itself to be anything close to a self-help book, and thankfully contains none of the inanities or triteness associated with such works. It does, however, have a lot to say about life in general, and despite the fact that many of its characters, particularly Bartle Booth, fail in their self-proclaimed life's work, Peric doesn't present this outcome as being necessarily bad. Ted Gioia of Fractious Fiction succinctly sums up what may be the novel's core theme as follows. To the extent that this book is a guide to life, it is a guide to failed life. I suspect that Parrot gave us 99 chapters, instead of closing with the expected 100th, as a reminder that we inevitably fall short of the imagined symmetry and perfection of our plans. Even arbitrary projects, he seems to say, can be meaningful improving our limitations and frail human nature. None of Parrot's characters, regardless of the disparate backgrounds from which they come, or the drastically different paths their stories take, are immune to life's inevitable disappointments, setbacks, and failures. Despite this, Every single one of their stories is intriguing in its own way. If there is potentially any piece of advice Peric wants us to infer from the novel's title, maybe this is it. That we should never forget that this same logic can be applied to everyone we come across in our own lives. We hope that you enjoyed this edition of Lit Tips. In our next episode, we will explore the life of Herman Melville. As always, please subscribe to our channel, check out our other videos, and leave a comment with your thoughts on this video along with suggestions for any books or authors you would like us to cover in future episodes. Until next time, keep reading.